I think the network will be okay later. Yeah. Yeah. So Xiao, so you uh, you you take the floor. <laughs> uh, sure, sure, sure. I will try to share my PowerPoint. So can anyone, can everyone see my PowerPoint? Yeah, it appears yeah. there. Okay. So hello everyone from uh, blockchain and multimedia data science seminar. My name is Wu Xiao. You can also call me Lin, which is my developer name in the GitHub. I'm the CEO of Bytematrix. It is a great honor to have this online lecture with all our friends. So today my topic is decentralizing the world blockchain and from uh, block, uh, not blockchain, decentralizing the world from blockchain to metaverse. So let me introduce myself. As you already know, my name is Wu Xiao. I'm currently the director of Yangtze River Blockchain International Innovation Center and the CEO of White Matrix. I received my master and bachelor degrees from the University of Alberta in 2015 and 2013 respectively. I'm still interested in doing some research with block, uh, research in blockchain area. So in 2019, I collaborated with Dr. Wei Cai, which will give us a topic later. And our manuscript, an interoperable avatar framework across multiple games and blockchains has been accepted to top rank conference IEEE Infocom 2019 demo sessions. And in 2020, I also won the first prize of China Blockchain Development Contest. I was invited to give public lectures to, and seminars to many universities in the last three years. And in the end, I'm also a coder, a dApp designer since 2018. I created several dApps and I'm experienced in designing smart contract. One slide about white matrix. So White Matrix is a technology company specialized in research and development of blockchain middleware technology and the global e developer ecosystem. Our core product is Chain ID, and Chain ID is a cloud-based integrity development environment that can help the development of smart contract. It is the first multi-chain ID that supports blockchain ecosystems such as Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, so operational in more than 160 countries, ChainID has compiled more than 5 million contracts and stands as one of the leading cloud-based ID platform in the crypto space. So next, uh, what I will do is I will give a brief talk about, oh, wait a minute, I think this one is coming down. Okay. No, it's okay. Sure. So now I will give a brief talk on some pre-knowledge about blockchain and dApps. The first concept I want to show you is smart contract. So a smart contract is a computer program executed in a secure environment that directly controls digital assets. The first blockchain system largely supports smart contract is Ethereum. Now many other blockchains also agree on this innovation and support this technology. You can treat it as a piece of functions code deployed on the blockchain. So anyone can call these functions with certain input and get a certain output. Because of the nature of blockchain, smart contract is a program where you can write standard logic rules that is immutable. When you put this contract on the blockchain, it will automatically execute it when specific conditions are matched. Another thing is about dApps. So dApp is a hot topic in the last two years. Usually a decentralized application's core logic is based on smart contract. We are much more familiar with applications in the contemporary society. So applications nowadays is a kind of basic unit provides services in the internet world. And dApps is a kind of the same thing, but created in the decentralized world. Dapps can provide services in many areas such as games, DEX, lending platforms, stable coins, crypto arts, and so on. What we want to introduce now is the uh, two leading projects in DeFi systems. So in the DeFi ecosystem, there are also excellent projects that continues to stand out. Compound is a lending project attracted a lot of deposits in its unique design, and Uniswap is 
an exchange project use AMM technologies. And what we call this kind of area is decentralized finance. There are several tokens can be borrowed and lended on compound. It's just like a bank on the blockchain. However, the total supply of the lumber is really huge. They are holding nearly 7 billion digital assets nowadays on the blockchain. So basically what it do is just like a bank, but written in smart contract, you can deposit your Ethereum into this bank and get USDC, which is the USD dollars on the blockchain out of it, just like the bank's uh, model, yeah. And Uniswap is the leading DeFi project that uses smart contract to do automated transactions. Uniswap is the design of AMM. Everybody can easily become a liquidity provider and the fee earned by trading will distributed to the liquidity providers. The interesting part is over 100 billion transactions are happened on Uniswap. The fact what will shock you is the 100 billion transactions is based on about 500 lines of code on the Ethereum when it is the first version come out. So what we interesting in is uh, how blockchain and smart contract will affect nowadays economy. So decentralized finance give us another way that we can try in this, in this world. Another thing I want to mention is about non-fungible tokens. This project is also interesting because it is also related to Canada. So CryptoKitties is the first NFT project in the world. And in this, it's one of, it is also one of the most popular dApps as blockchain games on Ethereum. It is developed by Canadian studio Axiom Zen that allow players to purchase, collect, breed, and sell virtual cats. And in this game, uh, the, Lots of people can own their own cats, and, and for their cats, they have a smart contract, which is is a ERC seven twenty one contract. The contract is directly mapping to the virtual cat on the blockchain, and it is one of the earliest adopt to deploy smart contract uh, deploy blockchain technologies for recreation and leisure. This game is very popular in December 2017, and it congested the whole Ethereum network. And after that, the, this studio is, was invested by Google, and nowadays they create their own blockchain systems called Flow. They're also from Vancouver, yeah. And the next thing I want to talk about is uh, from blockchain to metaverse. This one is really interesting. I want to use one quotation from Arthur Clarke. So any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. First, I want to illustrate what is metaverse. So the word metaverse is made up of the prefix meta. It means beyond. And the stem verse, it is a back information from universe. The term is typically used to describe the concept of a future iteration of the internet made up of persistent shared 3D virtual space linked into a perceived virtual universe. This term was coined in Neil Stephenson's uh, science fiction novel called Snow Crash, and this book is really good, and it is written in 1992. In this book, uh, humans as avatars interact with each other and the software agents in three-dimensional space and use metaphor of the real world. So if I just show you the novel, you won't get the idea of metaverse. What about a visualized example? If we want to present a more visualized example, I will use Ready Player One. So in the Ready Player One, you can do anything inside the Oasis. What I believe is in the future, 90% of human's activity will be in the metaverse. We can create brand new world with very low marginal cost. We can collaborate and create in the metaverse with AI, such as Java's and Stack work together. We can create pyramid and use gestures to zoom in and zoom out 
I think multimedia program also have this kind of uh, leap motion techniques and uh, this kind of technologies to do just things. And we can jump on the top of the pyramid with no gravity. We can accelerate our, our project inside the metaverse. We can nearly do everything inside the metaverse. So in Ready Player One, we can relax, we can work, we can even live in the metaverse. And what we believe is metaverse is our final fantasy. And also the cool thing is that uh, for our computer scientists, in metaverse, code is kind of everything. We can use code to create a digital twin of our Earth. We can live in the metaverse with infinity resources. Moreover, when we want to create models, we can use for loop and the libraries that we used before. So the metaverse world will expand, expand uh, faster and faster. And the metaverse is not only about a game. I think in the future, research, art, education, development, and design, all our human activities will be accelerated inside the metaverse. Uh, we do love metaverse. However, we are computer scientists, right? Let's think deeper about our techniques today. What we need to improve if we want to, if we want to see the genesis of the metaverse. I think the first one is perceptions. So nowadays, VR, AR, MR, multimedia, and uh, brain-computer interf interface technology is continuous expanding. But we still need more mature and extraordinary design to build, bring us into the metaverse. Uh, the second thing I want to mention out is, uh, is about regulation. So blockchain and smart contract can help to construct the metaverse economy and the regulations inside the decentralized world. We know blockchain is robust and hard to hack. We need blockchains and the smart contract to build up the infrastructure of the metaverse. The third thing is, is about mass productions. We do not want to build a realistic room inside the cyberspace, right? What we want to build is infinity universe, a digital infinity universe. That is why we need 5G to accelerate our efficiency. That is why we need data science to learn from the history metaverse and use AI to help us or even build our new world. So what we think is the metaverse will be the biggest opportunities in these centuries. And this one is also uh, verified by Roblox. So we all know Roblox is also listed as a public company uh, in the last month. And it is a, a company that is uh, he didn't have any kind of profit in the past 14 years. The last, comp the last company to do the similar things is Amazon. But all nowadays, they all, this kind of Roblox project is also listed on the public uh, stock. So what we think is we see the capitals believe in the potential of the metaverse and they give them some valuations and help them to list it on the public stock. And in the end, we hope to meet everyone inside the metaverse. We want to use our blockchain and other, uh, we want to use our blockchain and other uh, techniques to help the world, to bring the world into the metaverse. And that is basically what in my keynote today. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. So I will leave the, 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 the left time for the questions. So for the audience, do you have question? And you can also use the chat to post your question. So I think multimedia also have some projects related to kind of metaverse because you, we, we see interesting projects doing the, the, the just things, the leap motion things and 3D modeling, right? Yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, in, I, I have a question not relating to the multimedia yet, because uh, in multimedia, we have a course virtual reality and students mm -hmm. uh, use uh, Unity and create 3D games, uh, that kind of thing. But I want to go back to, do you remember years back mm -hmm. when Second Life was introduced? Oh, it was yeah. really popular, right? Yeah, so yeah, probably yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah. And do you see this uh, metaverse as the evolution of uh, Second Life 
And if so, what are the added values compared with Second Life? So from my point of view, the, the view, the, the technology and the, the economy or the market, they are kind of the uh, positive relations. So we all know AI, right? So for AI, they have several waves such as, oh, AI will save the world. No, 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 AI do not have any <laughs> economy <laughs> valuation. And we see another time, oh, AI will change the world. They will, they, they will ruin the, all human beings. And then we say, okay, AI cannot create a robotics that can work uh, stable. They, they, they use both the dynamics and they, 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 they do several things like, like that. So I think the metaverse is more mature in the contemporary society because we have more technologies. And uh, compared to the second life, what I'm more interested in is the first one is BCI, the brain computer interface. That is maybe in the future, we can use some physical device that can help us to connect into the cyberspace. This one is a kind of a key difference. The second one, what I believe is blockchain. So blockchain and the smart contract can reconstruct the economy and the regulations. So nowadays in Second Life, I think the most economy activities and the, more, the, the whole systems was built on the centralized uh, services or centralized uh, cloud uh, cloud services. But I think in the future, it should be a decentralized one. Just like the Ready Player One, there are different portals and each portal was built up by different teams and different uh, projects and they can connect together. And blockchain is this kind of techniques because we have consensus. Each one can connect into the standard consensus and get, connect into the standard protocols and we can link everyone together. That will decentralize the whole project. This is what I think. Maybe it is not correct, but I think the, the technology is more mature nowadays and we can a step, we can forward and a step, step one more step, yeah. Make one more step. Yeah, certainly technology is advancing yeah. from day to day, right? Yeah. And a lot of scientific fictions Gradually, you will find becoming true. And if uh, yeah. remember a recent movie, Avatar. So uh, when Avatar. you talk about brain computer interaction, yeah, yeah. so yeah. do you think that will come true? <laughs> yeah, what I think is our techniques, our, our technology nowadays is a kind of at the singular, sing, singulation point that everything is exploring. And we see Elon Musk want to go to Mars, right? And we see many, many interesting stuff uh, boom nowadays, such as blockchains, such as 5G, such as BCI. So I think we will go to that kind of world and that will be kind of the migration to cyberspace. cyberspace. I mean, all our human beings will change our way to live in the physical world into a digital world maybe. Right, yeah. So actually, I just want to uh, check the technical setup. I want to see whether the audience can use the chat to post question. Let me, how about uh, Hang? Can you tell me Hang? Hi. Can you, yeah, can you tell me whether you can use the chat? Oh, Hi. okay. Let me yeah. see. Yeah, I can see uh, Stephen post. Yes, we can use the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, that's cool, good. Cool. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So if you have any question, use a chat or you can, can you use raise hand? Do you see raise hand, the function? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's oh, good. Cool. So, so uh, if you have any question to the speaker, you can use either chat or raise hand. I think there's one question on the, in the chat. So it's from Stephen Fan. As we know, decentralization is usually not efficient in terms of TPS and transaction latency, especially in the context of big data. How to balance between security and efficient in metaverse? So this is kind of critical questions. I mean, the question is really good. Uh, nowadays in the industry areas, what we believe is blockchain is very weak. It's, it's a kind of a baby nowadays and uh, we, we, we do need to improve our TPS, which is a transaction per second. Uh, but what we believe is uh, blockchain also provide us to bring all the computer scientists together. 
we can program and deploy our smart contract, which is our programs on the same protocol and on the same, uh, same, same way. And this, this is kind of interesting because for the other problems, we can try to solve that later. But the first one is, this is the first time we can let all the developers together and try to execute their programs on the blockchain. And I think the other thing is in, in, the, in the blockchain area, we have a theory called uh, imbalance triangle. There are three, three directions that we cannot make all three of them together. I think the first one is uh, TPS, which is the, the performance. The second one is decentralization. So it's uh, how many ways that we want to decentralize our, pro our project. The third one, I can't remember it clearly, but maybe it's, it's a security, maybe it's a security. So this is a kind of hard topic and lots of papers and the theory try to figure out how to make the imbalanced triangles to, 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 to work, yeah. Uh, Chinema, yeah, 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 Chinema. Yeah, I think we still need some time to discover more in the trinema. But uh, what I believe is this is this is a kind of interesting idea to solve solve the world in the in the other way to to make the world uh, in, bring us into the metaverse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems to me that in North America, if actually you are the expert. Between uh, Canada and China, mm. the uh, development of uh, blockchain, how do you compare the two? Uh, I think Canada's uh, studios, just like the CryptoKitties, they, they are very innovative. And they, some of the Canadian industry can foresee the market and they can bring the, they can make their technology and their product very, I mean, they can make their product very innovative. But in China, I see a lot of projects, they do not have some blockchain native innovations. So what we do is we see some TPS and we try to make the TPS to be quicker and quicker. And if we see some interesting ideas such as NFTs, we will try to use NFT into other areas. So in China, I see a lot of uh, startups or the companies, they do things, they, they, are, they, they, they do things that like kind of uh, use the, the applications, use the technology, not create the technology. That's the two things that I see difference, yeah. Right, so you mentioned a lot of collaboration with uh, Africa, right? Yeah, so yeah. how do you see the development there in terms of blockchain? Ah, this is kind of interesting questions. So uh, at first, I mean, when we, when, we go to, when we bring seminars and online classes to Africa, I think maybe they are not interested, but the, the, the interesting thing is that a lot of African friends, they are very welcome and they're interested in coding, in smart contract and coding in blockchain systems. Uh, I can bring some data that about 200,000 uh, develop, uh, developers traffic was come to our platforms after last month's masterclass, which is our online seminars. And this is kind of uh, amazing because in China, we do not have that kind of traffic nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we have to set up some time to have your seminar in Canada as well to our <laughs> students. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So it seems uh, the audience is a bit quiet. <laughs> mm. so, so if we don't have other questions, how about we move to the next session? Sure, sure. I see Tim is already here. Maybe Tim can become the moderator in the yeah. next sessions. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thanks. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for the brilliant and inspiring keynote from uh, Xiao. And uh, I think it gave us a lot of like enlightenment and directions about the future development of uh, blockchain and also like metaverse. So, um, so I think this is a good start. And uh, the next chapter uh, is quite related to what I shall already like talk about. So, yeah. So here I would like to introduce our next speaker. So, uh, Doctor uh, Wei Tai. So, Doctor Wei Tai is currently uh, the professor of. 
Computer Engineering School of uh, School of Science and Engineering at Chinese University of Hong Kong Shenzhen, and he's also serving as the director of Human Cloud System Laboratory, as well as the director of the uh, CEU HK Shenzhen White Matrix Joint Metaverse Laboratory. So uh, I think his topic will be uh, quite related to what Xia already discussed. So uh, his interest, uh, his area of uh, interest is um, cloud computing, uh, edge computing, interactive and multimedia, and most important like blockchain. So also this area also like overlaps with, I think, MRC and the white matrix. So here um, I want to uh, hand it over to Professor Wei Tsai and uh, uh, he will present his topic on um, where blockchain meets interactive multimedia. Okay, thank you for your introduction. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Good. Okay, okay that's great. I just switched to a new network because my previous network doesn't work. Okay. Um, so yeah, probably I can start with uh, sharing my screen. Yeah, you can see my um, slides, right? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Maybe I can start. Um, Okay, so first, first of all, thank you for inviting me to uh, deliver this talk here. Um, actually, this is the um, research topic I have been working for more than two years. Um, well, first of all, briefly introduce myself. I, I actually got my PhD from Canada as well. I got my PhD from the University of British Columbia. And during my PhD, most of my time I spent research in the cloud gaming systems, which is the interactive multimedia systems. And right before I finished my PhD, is around 2015. A lot of people working on started to working on blockchain, especially you know cryptocurrencies. So I realized that okay, probably this is a new opportunity for us to do research, and I started to get into this area. And it seems this is interesting, and of course there are lots of resources to be spent on this area. So um, I I connect blockchain with my previous experience in interactive multimedia. So that's why the topic will be the blockchain is interactive multimedia. And to be honest, uh, Xiao already showed a lot of uh, exciting futures of this area. So I think my presentation will be like an extension to his work, okay, to his, his topic. So I will skip some part of the slides. And if we have more time, we can we can talk through the, um, uh, the Zoom here. We can have a panel discussion if we can. <laughs> so first of all, First of all, um, a brief introduction of what's going on with blockchain. I'm pretty sure that all of you know what's going on with blockchain. This is a summary from, uh, from my perspective because my previous uh, background is related to network multimedia. So I feel like blockchain is similar. Okay? The te techniques for blockchain is very similar to network models. In network communi communities, we will, uh, we will divide the network research into several layers, okay? seven layers. And similarly here for blockchain, we might have multiple layers of research and, and study as well. For example, from physical layers and network layers, they are very similar to networking. You have uh, uh, physical layers, data layers, and, and, and network layers. And in network la layers, we all know we are, we are actually relying on peer-to-peer -peer network to support um, distributed ledgers and everything. And for data layers, what's more interesting here is that we have timestamps and Merkle trees. Okay, so those, those are something special in, in blockchain. And on top of network layer, as a uh, new technique, okay, blockchain has consensus layers. Okay, we have POW, POS, DPOS. Uh, those, are, those are something very new to this community. And in, indeed, this is probably, in my opinion, the most important research areas in improving the performance of blockchain. And on top of the consensus models, we have incentive layers. So mining rewards, transaction fees, those are incentive layers. Nowadays, this layer become more and more important because unfortunately, until today, okay, most of the applications on blockchain still relies on you know, speculations. We hope that we have more applications on top of the blockchain system. And in that case, we need better incentive layers so that we can motivate developers and also the users to use the new system. On top of the incentive layers, we have contract layer and application layer. Contract layer will be the smart contract. After Ethereum has been introduced to the community, we have smart contracts. We are able to, we are able to write decentralized applications based on smart contract. So that will be a brief introduction of my view in blockchain, different layers. So what will be the interactive multimedia? Well, as topics address, right? We have these two uh, techniques together. 
Um, well, interactive multimedia itself is a big topic. We have lots of things related to interactive multimedia. Here, I'd like to introduce three of them. Okay, actually, I'm working on those three. The first one will be, of course, the computer games, right? The video games, especially the network games. The second one, TikTok. Okay, TikTok is the most famous one. The video sharing social networks. Of course, we have more, uh, more applications related to social networks and video sharings, but TikTok probably was the most famous one. And the last one is a very hot topic in research community recently. That would be the digital twin. Actually, digital twin uh, at the first beginning uh, was introduced in the uh, mechanical uh, communities. They use digital twin to simulate the real world, especially simulate the robotics. But now this concept has been extended to visualizations of the uh, interactive systems. And also uh, this digital twin concept has been applied to uh, lots of new areas, for example, like small cities and everything. So well, I'd like to briefly introduce our, our work in digital twin as well. So let's start from, um, from games. How about we start from games? I, I know a lot of, especially for young, young guys, you, got, you like uh, playing games. Me too. I, I, I spend a lot of time playing games. So how can blockchain empower the interactive multimedia? Well, probably game is the best approach. Okay, Bad game is the best example. Especially, you know, nowadays most of the new techni technologies uh, become successful because, because they start from games, right? Even for AI, you know, a lot of people are working on AI, but uh, well, this wave of AI actually starting from AlphaGo, everyone knows about, right? AlphaGo is a game, it's a typical game, right? So let's start from uh, games. Well, well, every single time when I talk about blockchain and the games, I would like to, well, get the quote from Vitalik, okay, the, the founder of Ethereum. And this is, this is something uh, he, read, he, he wrote on his uh, About Me page. He said, I was born in 1994 in Russia and moved to Canada in two, 2000 when I went to school. I happily played World of Warcraft during 2007 to 2010, but one day Blizzard removed the damage component from my beloved Warlock's Siphon life spell. So he said, I cried myself to sleep and on that day I realized what horror centralized service can bring. So I soon decided to quit. I'm not sure about your experience in playing games, but you know, when I was in high school, I spent a lot of time playing games as well, especially for online games, those MMORPG, massive multiplayer online uh, RPG games. I, I like them really very much, okay? So to be honest, when I was a kid, I'm not a really good student. So I, sometimes I quit my lectures and, and, and play games some, somewhere, okay? But um, I, I, have, I noticed that because I'm currently working in universities, okay? Lots of students, they, they would like to spend lots of time playing games as well. But unfortunately, uh, I don't see very good MMORPG games uh, anymore. Okay, most of our students, for example, they play of League of Legends or something. Um, in my opinion, those are no uh, real online games. Yes, they use network to connect to each other. They, um, they can create small rooms so that uh, they are able to match with each other. They can play the games. Um, well, if you go back to 10, 10 years ago, well, we, we have similar games as well. For example, what, what, uh, we, we have uh, uh, StarCraft, okay, those games. Uh, we will call them a... Uh, uh, while uh, a, a local area network games, okay, the LAN games, because technically it didn't connect it to the internet, it didn't connect it to the whole world. Instead, you're creating a small room and you are actually playing with your friends. And after you finish one round, the room will be destroyed. It's so nothing left. Okay, next time you start a, a game again, you will you will you will have you 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 will start everything from the beginning. So I noticed this phenomenon while well, the young guys. Young kids, they don't play uh, MMORPG anymore. And I believe uh, one of the reasons will be like this, okay? Because the operators, they have, uh, they have you know, all the control of the system, okay? So unfortunately, in order to get more profits, they might want to, you know, they might want to get more, uh, they might want to uh, modify, okay? Modify the, the, the parameters, change the parameters so that uh, they are able to balance the system, especially considering the newcomers to the system. They would like to uh, encourage more participants of the game. So that's why, you know, the old players, those those players who spend a lot of time on MMORPG, they might don't feel very well regarding this change, right? Just like uh, Vitalik's experience. So this is the issue of state of uh, state of the art online games, especially for MMORPG. Okay, these are two critical questions you might ask yourself, right? First one, do you really own a virtual item in MMORPG? The second one, can players participate in the process of game evolution? 
So the first question, well, if you really read the readme before you enter an MRPG game, you realize that you don't owe anything in the game, okay? Technically, you spend your money, you spend your time on the game, but you are actually renting a service from the game operators. You get nothing, okay? You just get the, the, uh, the, the, the property of using them, but you, you, don't, you don't really own them, okay? So that's why, you know, after you spend so many years on one game, one day suddenly they, they turn off turn on their, their, their server, you're not able to uh, get them back anymore. And for the second question, of course, you, you don't have any power in negotiating with the uh, game operators and developers. The game developers and the game, uh, the, the game operators, they are the god in the game world, right? Technically they can do whatever they want. They have GMs, even though for those GMs, they have strong powers. Um, as a player, you're not able to do anything. Right, so probably you don't you don't like the, the change of the version, but there's nothing you can do. So that will be two critical issues in state of the art online games. So, is it possible that we can use blockchain to really address these issues so that we are able to have a better version of the online games? Well, in our opinions, yes, we are able to do that. And um, first of all, I would like to briefly introduce what's going as blockchain games, the definitions. Okay. Well, actually, this is this is the definition from our paper published in IEEE Conference on Games 2019. Um, we said that the series of digital games designed and implemented based on the nature of blockchain techno technologies will be called blockchain games. So, what do you mind? What do you mind the nature of blockchain technologies? Well, probably I can show you one game developed by Tension, one of the largest company in the world in China. And this is one of the game, okay? They, they actually, as you can see, well, if, if you ever play the Pokemon Go, you realize it's very similar to Pokemon Go, right? It's the Chinese version of a copy, uh, Pokemon Go. Of course, it's specialized in Chinese characters and features. In this game, they, they commit itself to be a blockchain game because they you are able to raise kids, okay? It's more like a connecting the Pokemon Go and Crypto Kitty, Kitties, right? So they, you're able to, to raise the kitties and these kitties have genes and you're able to ride the kitties to the blockchain. Okay, so that will be what they call blockchain games. Unfortunately, I would say this is not a real blockchain game. Why? First of all, the data will be written into the block uh, tension servers. So it's a private, private blockchain. Okay, so technically, uh, there's no certificates from the public. Okay, and unfortunately, if if the uh, if the tension they want to really want to change something, they can still modify it. Okay, this is very important, right? So unfortunately, you don't really own them. Okay, you didn't really own them, right? And especially there's no transparency. Okay, there's nothing related to the feature of blockchain. So what, what exactly blockchain can bring to us? Here yeah, I'd like to summarize okay, some of the uh, features the blockchain games can bring to the game community. The first one is through transparency. The second one is access ownership. The third one is reusability of the access and the fourth one will be the user generated content. So actually in, in that paper, we summarize some of the games, okay, some of the games. Um, uh, due to a time limitation, I will not go through all of them, but I would like to show you some examples. The first one, okay, regarding the rules transparency, um, I would like to show you this one, Formal 3D, okay? Probably many of you know this game, it's a gambling game, okay? It's a very famous gambling game. So in this game, you are able to invest your money okay, to the, uh, uh, by, by sending by, by sending your uh, ethers to the smart contract, okay, sitting on the on the on the blockchain. So it, it, once the uh, ether, once the smart contract receive your uh, receive your ether, they will consider that okay, you are you are taking a bit. Okay, so so the smart contract will uh, will be automatic uh, gambling machines for everyone to play the game. Okay, so Formal Three D was very popular at the moment. Okay, there are lots of people participating in this game. Why is so popular? Because well, Formal Three D becomes a new models. Okay, new models for gambling games. Well, if you go to, uh, for example, Las Vegas or Macau in China, okay, um, you, you're able to participate in gambling games. Uh, but but you need to. Well, the assumption is that you you need to you need to trust right. You need to trust the third party who run the. Uh, the casino, right? The, those that's, those casino, uh, they, they they run the game. They, they run the game for you guys as a third party, and and uh, <clears throat> you need to trust that their their tools are, are valid and they, they don't they don't cheat. Unfortunately, for most of the users, most of the players, you're not able to do that. To be honest, all you, all you can do is to trust, right? But with smart contracts, with blockchain, 
things become easy because well, all the source codes of the smart contract, they are open sourced. So you can, you can get a source code, you can check their logic to see if they are really fair to everyone, right? So this is a very good innovation, okay, innovation for gambling games. Uh, technically, you don't need a third party anymore. All you can do is that you can send ethers to the smart contract and you're able to, uh, you have to play the game okay, with the uh, authorized uh, third party. Of course, still, this one will bring a lot of issues, right? Because, well, as you can see, the smart contract itself is transparent, it's um, public to everyone. So uh, it, it becomes vulnerable, right? Um, everyone can, can check if, if there are any, any faults or any uh, problems, any bugs on the smart contract. And you probably can steal monies from those smart contracts. Okay? So it becomes very difficult for us to write a perfect smart contract. But anyway, this is the first feature, the rules transparency. The second one is that after we have blockchain, we really have the ownership of the game access, those virtual items. Well, on the very first day of the Bitcoin, we really changed the world because we are able to really own a virtual item, right? a virtual token. Before that, before blockchain, before Bitcoin has been introduced to the world, unfortunately, uh, we cannot really own a virtual item because virtual item is a digital asset. It's really easy to be copied, right? You're able to copy the same items for multiple times. So in order to verify that you really own that copy, you need a third party, right? A third party so that this, this third party will keep a record of the belongings of the digital access. Unfortunately, well, as I discussed, the third party sometimes is not reliable However, with Bitcoin, we have a real ownership with a uh, game access, okay, with virtual items okay, without a third party. So this idea has been applied to a game at the first beginning, which is the most famous game in the world, uh, crypto currency, uh, crypto kitties, right? The most famous game in blockchain world. This is actually a game developed in Vancouver. Um, so CryptoKitties, once you play the game, you realize that you are able to really purchase and own a CryptoKitty. And then you are able to breed, you are able to raise the kitties. Okay, so it, 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 was, it was very, very popular. Actually, it stuck the traffic of Ethereum at that moment as well. Okay, so you, you do really have the ownership. That would be a very important part. For the third one, the usability, reusability. Okay, well, once you own a virtual item, you might want to reuse them in many, many places rather than just use them in one game. This is, this is, this is probably the definition of real ownership, right? If you own, a, you, you, you own a, a game asset, but you can only use the, the asset in one game, then probably it's not that attractive, not that attractive. It would be very attractive if you are able to purchase a virtual item from one place and you use them everywhere. So, um, well, I think the CryptoKitties, okay, the Dapper Labs, the founder, uh, the creator of the CryptoKitty uh, company, uh, they, they're trying to develop a ecosystem, okay, or where we said that, um, uh, well, it's more like, a, yes, it's an ecosystem. Yeah, it's an ecosystem uh, to, uh, around the CryptoKitties. For example, like this one, the Kitty Race. So technically you can use the CryptoKitties you receive from the, uh, uh, site, okay, you, you, you purchase from the CryptoKitty uh, web page and you can reuse them somewhere. For example, like this one, Kitty Race, you're able to race with other kitties to own other, uh, to, to earn tokens or something else, okay. So CryptoKitty and, and Kitty Race is a very good example how you're gonna really own an asset and reuse the assets. And the fourth one, okay, fourth one is regarding the user-generated content. Well, to be honest, uh, I'm not sure if you have, do we have any uh, game developers here? Um, when you're trying to design and develop a game, you realize um, uh, it's this challenge to really make your game last long. What do you mean by this? Well, if you, for example, there, there are two kinds of games, right? One, one, one kind of game would be like story-based, story-based. So you might uh, create a game and then uh, the players will work through the, the, the story and after finish the story, probably they won't continue. They won't go back to the beginning and do it again. Probably not. Or probably they will do it again, but probably one or two times that will be enough. So um, that will be the single player games. For multiple player games, 
well, you might want to create a basic storyline as well. But at the same time, you would like to encourage interactions among different users. That will be the key of multiplayer games. However, however, in order to extend the lifetime of the game, then most likely you might want to create more contents later as well, so that you're able to stimulate these players to continue. So how would you do that? Well, traditional games, in traditional games, you might have a team to generate new contents for the players. Unfortunately, well, if your game are really popular, you have lots of game players, sometimes you're not able to uh, produce sufficient contents for players to consume. So um, it become very popular to have user-generated content games. For example, the most famous one would be the uh, uh, Minecraft, right? Uh, those, those games that the players, they can generate their, their world and then they're able to, uh, to, to last very long. With, crypto, uh, with cryptocurrency, with blockchains, um, user-generated content uh, will be even more popular because technically, if you create something, okay, some virtual items in the game, you really own the game. So, and especially you can sell them, you can reuse them somewhere else. Okay, so based on those features, we will say that blockchain will strongly encourage the uh, players to generate those new contents. So I think uh, in our previous discussion, uh, uh, Professor Chen already mentioned the, the, the Second Life, right? Second Life is a very famous game and they also have an ecosystem. Uh, they have financial system. They use a, a coin called Linden coin. And then Linden coins could be exchanged to US dollars uh, with one-to-one -one proportion. But um, uh, and then, uh, well, Second Life is very, was very popular. Okay, it was very popular. But uh, to be honest, it's not easy to maintain a real ecosystem it's not easy to, to maintain the, the value of Linden coins uh, for a long time. And especially, well, I was a player of Second Life as well. Um, to be honest, I've, 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 I've been studying computer science and engineering for a long time. Okay, uh, When I was in high school, I spent most of the time of, of writing code. But as a player, as an engineer, as a computer scientist, I still feel difficult to use Second Life, the tools provided by Second Life to generate the contents. It's difficult for me, okay? So, well, it could be easily imagined that most of the players might feel difficult to, to use that, that kind of tool to generate the contents. So, well, I think crypto voxels are trying to solve this problem by using the voxel monitoring problem um, tools, okay? Uh, uh, voxel is, is, is relatively easy for, for a, a novice players to model uh, 3D stuff. Okay, actually, I will show you an example later. Uh, in, in our university, we're trying to create a digital twin for our university. And for the, in the first version, we hired a number of students who have no experience in modeling. So we decided to choose Voxel. And apparently, it's, it's a very good move. Okay, we spent about two months and we modeled the whole university okay, from, from beginning. So it seems crypto Voxel is running towards this direction. So they will encourage the players to participate and, and spend most of the time generating the new contents for the game. Okay. So anyway, this is the uh, user generated contents, um, the, another feature of it. So um, actually in our paper, we spent, uh, it was a 2019 paper. So we collect the data from Ethereum and also EOS. At the moment, EOS is just very popular. So we um, collect data from Ethereum and EOS platforms to see uh, how uh, active the game is and, and will be the traffic on the uh, blockchain games. And according to our analysis, those are two figures. The, first, the top one will be the active uh, user numbers and the bottom one will be the active user uh, proportions. Well, as you can see, right, uh, well, at the beginning of 2017, there's a, there, there was a, a, a heap on the uh, use, active users. That will be the release of the crypto uh, crypto kitties, okay, crypto kitties. By the end of uh, 2018, there will be another heap, right, on EOS. And in fact, that will be the release of the EOS night, right? EOS night. So we're trying to see if the blockchain game is a big thing in blockchain, uh, in blockchain world. So the proportion of daily active users games, as you can see from the figures in the bottom, well, there will be 30% to 60% of the traffic actually coming from blockchain games, according to our study. Okay, this is actually a typical uh, data, okay, data from, from what, we, what we see from the blockchain. And while well, considering that most of the traffic of the uh, blockchain transactions will be the exchange, right? Because we, we have to admit that mo nowadays, still most of our traffic will be speculations on the tokens, coins. So given we have uh, such uh, 
such big traffic for exchange, while 30% to 60% is amazing, right? So while I would say that was, uh, 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 well, by the end of 2018, still most of our, our uh, applications will be the games, okay? Of, co of course, including the gamblings. So, well, probably I can answer these two questions and the first being you post, okay? Um, blockchain games, is it the future of MMORPG? Well, maybe yes, okay, maybe yes, right? Because uh, for blockchain games, you, you do really own a virtual item, right? You're able to uh, preserve your wealth by fungible tokens, right? And you're able to preserve your characters, weapons, land, and whatever you want, the, all the virtual items with non-fungible tokens. So, you know, nowadays it's interesting, it's interesting, right? Especially if you're playing a number of games, right? Well, unfortunately, we don't have, uh, we don't have reuse, very good reusability for characters, weapons, land, those non-fungible tokens. But actually, we have very good systems of preserving the wealth. Because if you receive tokens from the game, then most likely you can sell them, right? You can sell them the game in exchange. Well, you can sell them with USDT or Ether or Bitcoins. That means that your wealth okay, is really preserved. And the second one, can players really participate in the process of game evolution? Well, the answer is yes, right? We have an example already. Well, I'm pretty sure that many of, one, uh, many of you know the, the Axie Infinity, right? This is probably the most famous game last year. Um, in the Axie Infinity, when you play the game, you receive tokens, and those tokens could be used as a governance tokens, which means that you are able to participate the player governance, okay, through those tokens, through the voting process. This is a very good um, future of games. Well, it means that uh, game operators, game developers, they cannot arbitrarily modify the game as they want. Okay, the players, they will make decisions. They will make decisions. Actually, a short show, uh, a short talk that um, in the future, probably um, the, the game developers and the game operators and the game players, they, they will need to uh, participate in the process of negotiations. So um, the game developers, okay, they might propose a new future, right? For example, they can they propose a new version describing the change of the game. And the operators, they might, they might negotiate with the uh, players. If the players agree, okay, the governance, they, they use governance, uh, government uh, tokens to vote. If they agree, then the upgrade of the game becomes successful. Otherwise, well, there might be two directions to go, right? One will be like, okay, the game developers, they cancel this update or, or there will be a fork, okay? There will be a fork. So there'll be two versions of the games, okay? Well, actually this is, this, is, this is so important. This is so important because when I was a kid, as I said, I spent most of my time playing games, right? MMORPG games, especially uh, when I was a kid, there was a game called uh, Jing Yong. Okay, probably I don't, I'm, not, I'm not able to say how we're going to translate it. Okay, so it's, it's a Jing Yong Qin Xia Zhuan. It's a game, okay? We spent lots of time playing that game. And, but unfortunately, okay, after the, uh, uh, the, the operation of the game for more, two or three years, they, they have lots of updates and we don't like it at all. Okay? We don't like it at all. So uh, that, that, that game become uh, not successful after four, four or five years running. Okay. And well, that, that, you know, that, that game was, was started uh, when I was in high school. Okay. And what's interesting is that after I finished the game, okay, I, I, after I, 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 I moved to, Can uh, moved to uh, Korean for my postgraduate study and I, I realized that they, they again, okay, they, um, uh, they, they release an, an, an old version of the, the game to, to, to try to attract the old players so that we are, they hope that we can come back and play the game there. Okay, so probably in the future that becomes possible, right? We have multiple versions of the game given we have player governance. So, well, in order to facilitate uh, the future of the games, we do have a lot of research works. And today I would like to share you some of them. Um, the first one is called Interoperable Frameworks for Blockchain Games. In this, uh, this is actually a collaboration with, uh, between our lab and and and, and one matrix. We we create a uh, we we create a, a a contract called Contract Genius, so that we are able to connect different trains and different games. We can use one player character to uh, uh, so that we can use one character to 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 play in different games. Okay, to play different games. So in order to facilitate that, we uh, create uh, multiple games. Last trip, Adam's venture and also Red, uh, Rhythm Dungeons. 
those are the games we um, uh, we created to facilitate uh, to demonstrate the possibility of the uh, 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 we, I see chats. Okay. Um, uh, here is something. Okay. Anyway, so um, yeah, so so we, we try to uh, we, we use those games to demonstrate um, the the future of of those games. For example, like this one, the last one, the Wrath and Dungeon. This is a game we developed to. It's, it's a music. It's a music game, and uh, you are able to play with the heroes. Okay, you can use the heroes, and and then after you finish the, your journey, when you die, right, uh, your heroes will be updated to the uh, to the blockchain. So in the future, you're able to see that hero in the blockchain okay so probably i can demonstrate one minute uh a video this is how you're gonna uh play the game So that will be a demonstration regarding how you're going to connect, try to uh, connect different game worlds together. Okay. And the second research we would like to show you today is a consensus for games. Um, actually, someone raised the same question, right? Uh, the performance of the blockchain becomes a problem uh, for, for, for the, the metaverse or the game world. And we do realize that problem. And we hope that we are able to provide a good solution for it. And this is one of our work. Um, we create a new consensus model so that we are able to use the consensus model to build P2P network based decentralized multiplayer game servers. Well, the basic idea is that uh, we have assumption. The assumption is that the more time you play, less probability it will cheat. So we will actually use your game time, your efforts on the game as the um, as a proof of writing blocks, okay, writing blocks. Well, due to a time limitation, I won't go into the details, okay? But the, um, the the real challenge is that we need to avoid large amount of faults, and we want to create rules right, to establish so that to avoid large number of potential block writers. So we're actually creating a new consensus model. And of course, if you're interested in this paper, you might want to read a paper from uh, International ACM International Symposium Blockchain and Security Critical Infrastructure. We published paper there. Uh, we described and, and analyzed the performance of the uh, protocols. Um, actually, this paper has been re uh, we received the best paper, uh, best student paper award from from the conference. And based on this consensus model, we also built a a, uh, a, a demo. And this demo has been published in ACN Multimedia uh, demo check. So I, I can show you a quick video regarding how you're gonna do this. Uh, the name of the uh, the name of demo is called Infinity Battles. Okay, so you never uh, stop the battles if you, if you have more and more players come join the, the game. Hi everyone, now I would like to demo. It is a pity that there is no peer-to-peer -peer game working with this idea. In our demo, we fill up this blank and propose Infinity Battle, which will become an example for future reference. In this video, I let you know how the game plays and subsequently show you the information on the blockchain. I create four windows for four different players, we assume Alice and Bobo played the game individually while Andrew and Tim are in the same team. We need to wait for them entering the battlefield. Okay, now you finished. First, each player should pick their own hero and therefore we randomly select one for these four players. Afterwards, we start the game and play.
the match is over and we can see Andrew and team are winners. Congratulations to these two players. And now let's turn our eye to the information on the blockchain. Firstly, we can see the length of current blockchain is two and there is a match waiting for synchronization. If MVP of current match is applicable to become the next block writer, the next block also contains the information of that match. As we can see, the pending match list is empty and a new block appears, which means these two matches are well stored by the blockchain system. Let's have a final check whether all players have the same blockchain information. Simply, we only need to check the hash value of the final block. After checking, they have the same result indicating that the blockchain information is consistent among these four players. This is all for our demo video. Thank you for your watching. So with this approach, we are able to, uh, to uh, synchronize the different data in, uh, in, in, in different peers in a P2B network uh, games. Yeah. So that will be something we have done okay, for, for, uh, for blockchain games. Actually, we have more research works. If you're interested, you can visit our website. Uh, you can see our demonstrations and our, also our research papers. And the next topic, okay, or probably the extension to the blockchain games, we might say that in the future, okay, in the future, we are we envision a, a metaverse world, okay, the metaverse world. Okay, and as Shao just just mentioned, the snow crash is the starting point of the uh, uh, metaverse, and 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 probably you can see that. Um, okay, this is a video. Probably we don't have time to, to show you all the videos, but you can see this is the. Uh, how are you going to connect it to Metaverse with Except VR? Anyways. Virtual universe. People come to the Oasis for all the things they can do. But they stay because of all the things they can be. Can you feel this? Yeah. It's the only place that feels like I mean anything. Yeah, so that will be the future. Well, a human interaction. Well, if you have a human computer interaction uh, devices ready, then probably uh, the metaverse becomes a reality. It okay, becomes reality. And actually, metaverse uh, become very interesting because nowadays we can see a lot of lots of uh, events to be held virtually online. This is a um, also a, a video clip showing a um, a, a concept, okay, a concert, a music concert by the Forty Nine Games. Okay, probably I can I can show you a little bit uh, regarding how how you're gonna put this in uh, in the concert. It's it's amazing. Sun is down, freezing cold. That's how we already know. Bring it here. My dog will probably do it for Louisville. That's just all he know. He don't know nothing else. I tried to show him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gone on you with the pick and roll. Younger flame here in sickle mode. As you can see, right, this is a really good experience. I mean, regarding the virtual concert. Uh, actually, um, before the COVID-19, I, I participate in a, uh, a conference uh, organized by Yale, and they show a lot of live concerts with VR. And to be honest, if you really use that devices to check those uh, concepts online, you realize it's much, much better than the real world because um, you're able to use all digital uh, 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 tech technologies to improve your experience. Okay? For example, like you're able to, for example, like this one, right? You're able to make it, make, make, make the uh, singer very huge. So, so the experience is completely different. But regarding the metaverse, okay, in the future, well, we will envision a metaverse, but, but unfortunately, uh, still, we have a lot of challenges regarding metaverse. Okay? One of the most critical problem is the economics, because, well, eventually, you build up, you build up metaverse on top of uh, blockchain, you will need to consider the balance, okay, the balance of the world. 
especially um, when I'm not sure if you check the, the the Ready Player One that movie. If you check the movie, you realize that um, the, the the game developers, okay, the game developers become uh, the, the the company becomes the become dominating the, the world, right? So it shouldn't be like that. It should be a decentralized and distributed world. So um, there might be a lot of game worlds in metaverse, and we need to connect those worlds so that we are able to establish a whole metaverse. Then the balance has become very important. Nowadays, we, we, we're still working on this research. How are we gonna create balance between among different worlds and we're able to uh, really go through different worlds with, with, with the same values, okay? And uh, we do have a lot of research in this area as well. For example, uh, one of the most famous uh, 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 IPO last year, probably the uh, PopMart. Okay? I'm not sure if it's famous in, in, in Canada, but it's very popular in China. Uh, PopMart has a, a sales model, model that will be the blind box. Okay? Or in a game, or in the metaverse, we will, we will say that will be a loot box. So uh, there will be a lot of economic studies around this. We have been spending a lot of time on doing this as well. Okay? And we are submitting a number of conference papers recently. Hopefully we are able to uh, get accepted and share the similar, uh, those, those research results soon. Okay? And also at the same time, okay, if you really want to run a successful system, you might want to consider the commercial models as well. Okay. Um, well, I would say nowadays the most uh, popular commercial model will be free to play model. Okay, free to play model. So we spend uh, some time on studying the free to uh, free to play model as well. Um, nowadays, you know, in 2020, okay, 2020, digital game spending grew uh, 12 year over year and reaching 127 billion across mobile, PC, and consoles. So uh, these free to play games generate the majority of the revenue at 98.4 billion, okay? around 78% uh, 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 of the total. Okay? So um, there are lots of successful uh, free to play games, actually uh, different types as well, okay? different types as well. So we're thinking about the models of the uh, free to play games and we'd like to see if they could be used in blockchain. In fact, if you really study the profits of those games, you realize that the profits only contribute by one of one to five percent of the players. We call them the wheel of the games. Okay, so actually around uh, zero point nineteen percent of the whales contribute half of the revenue. So the question is, can those free players, right, the majority of players, be used to generate the income? Well, the answer is yes. Okay. Well, nowadays we let the free players watch advertisements. Okay, advertisements. So we, we, we actually analyze the, the scenario and try to uh, perform an analysis to see if we're able to, we are able to further improve the uh, revenue and income for, uh, for in-game games so that we're able to improve the, uh, the financial models for metaverse. Um, we, we use a, a game theory to do a, a two-stage urban game. And well, the result is that while well, there exists a equilibrium in this revenue model, and the game developer providers will get more profits and the overall player experience increased and the advisor will enter the game market and promote his brands. Okay. So this paper I just accepted by ACM workshop on game systems this year. So we have finished the talk on the video game. How about the others? Okay. The video sharing and social network or the digital twin? Well, due to time limitations, I won't spend too much time talking about those, but video sharing social network definitely will be a big market, right? Now, well, nowadays, TikTok, a very famous company, right, in China. Well, I think it's, it's a world famous company now. Um, it's a very typical video sharing social network. But the real challenge is how can we fairly distribute the revenues to all the creators of those contents? Stimit, I'm not sure if you know, Stimit uh, created by BN, uh, running on, uh, well, it's more like a US like systems. Uh, Stimit was uh, probably the first social network we have ever seen in blockchain world. But I'm pretty sure that in the, in the near future, after the DeFi becomes uh, uh, sophisticated, we, have, we will have more and more social network be supported by, so, uh, by, by, by uh, blockchain so that we're able to compensate the IP, okay, the, the content generators. For example, like LBRY, a blockchain driven YouTube. Okay, you are able to upload your videos then and get conversations for, for the platforms. Because of the blockchain's feature, right? Uh, transparency and fairness, democracy, right? Everything will be, will be great. 
okay, with this platform, with blockchain. So I'm pretty sure that in the future, social network will be supported by blockchain as well, as well as the video sharing. And the last topic, in fact, the blockchain driven digital twin. Uh, nowadays, digital twin is so, so hot in China, where we spend a lot of time and money, the government spent lots of money on, on investing, uh, getting the digital twin uh, infrastructures. And we, we actually have those uh, studies as well with uh, matrix, uh, with Y matrix. And this is one of our video showing the uh, uh, blockchain driven uh, uh, digital twin campers. Unfortunately, it's in Chinese, but uh, probably can take a look. <laughs> So this is a project we finished last year. Okay, we actually, based, uh, based on this model, we create a game as well. And this year for the CU Education Gen Metaverse, this is a new version, a network version. We're trying to connect all the students into the virtual metaverse in our university. And we hope that we are able to collect uh, information from them. And we also hope that the students can make friendships and connectivities in this uh, metaverse. Uh, this year, so hopefully we 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 can we can start this project uh, by the end of uh, this summer. So regarding the research directions, well, we do have a lot of research directions in in this area. Okay, especially for uh, blockchain. Well, for interactive multimedia, we we need to spend a lot of time on on graphics, encoding, signal processing, virtualizations, artwork, computer visions, and human computer interactions. And for blockchains, while well, security definitely will be one of the most critical issues, and performance, as I said, the the, the, the consensus models. Architectures and front uh, front ends will be very important as well because well I will show you in the next slide okay and also the network economics just the one I show you in order to improve the the engagement of the uh, uh, the, the community we need better network economics and also for blockchain one of the critical issue is that we are able to build smart contract but unfortunately ninety percent according to our study ninety percent of the smart contracts are sitting there wasting the 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 the, the storage we. They, they don't do anything. No one calls those smart contract. So in fact, the service market is also very important. We should be able to connect those smart contract services together to form a, a, a market so that we are able to improve the uh, usabilities of those uh, smart contract. We have a lot of paper working on these areas. Probably you can see them in the future. So why, why the uh, architecture is important? Well, this is a typical architecture of uh, blockchain games or probably most of the blockchain applications, decentralized applications. Now we have lots of attacks, okay? We have attacks on the blockchain, we have attacks on the, uh, on the web page. Okay? Actually, well, nowadays we have lots of problems of our, on our smart contract. But what I would like to emphasize here is that we didn't realize that many problems actually uh, happens in the game server okay? and the server side. Okay, traditional servers because they are not really decentralized applications. They they they, they still need to uh, use game server to provide an interface, provide an interface for the players because the play most of the players they will not directly interact with the smart contracts. So to be honest, we really hope that we need really hope that in the future we can see real transparent depths, which means that we don't need to rely on the game server server. Everything should be running on the blockchain, and we uh, we work with. Y matrix to, to develop similar uh, applications recently as well. Okay, hopefully we can see those applications soon. And um, well, due to the time limitation, I'm not able to share you the, this work, but um, this work in fact is also a very interesting work. We can use blockchain to, to support all kinds of economics, including the cloud gaming services. Okay, uh, some of you might know cloud gaming, right? Um, we are able to use cloud to server to, to, to run the, the game and, and stream the game to all the players. You don't have to download the game, you can play it. Unfortunately, until today, we don't have successful models. We don't have good pricing strategy. And in our paper, we realized that blockchain driven uh, cryptocurrency will be a very good solution. Okay, Due to a time limitation, I will, I will, I will just skip that, this part. Okay? But what I can tell you is that we're trying to, um, we're trying to, um, uh, trying to 
get the idea of our, we, 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 our work has been inspired by the traditional archive room. So those cryptocurrency tokens will be like the tokens you use in the in, in traditional archive room. Okay, go back to 30 years ago, you have those games. Okay, so we, use, we, we, we analyze the models and we realize that this is a very good model to uh, generate a great pro uh, profits and also good gaming experience for players. We develop prototypes and this paper has been published before as well. Okay, so that will be it for my talk. And um, and to be honest, we, we have a lot of multiple openings in for PhD and postdoc uh, positions, especially we established the, the, the new lab, the uh, uh, CUHK Shenzhen and Y Matrix joint metaverse lab. So if you have interest in, in purchase for PhD, then probably you can contact me as well. Okay, so that will be it for my talk today. Thank you very much. That will be the Q&A time. Hey, thanks for uh, Professor Wei Tai's uh, brilliant talk. And uh, uh, I, I already, I've already seen like several like hands raised up during the talk. So if there's, if you still have a question, just uh, raise your hand. And I also see there, there are some like comments left in the chat. So probably like Professor uh, Wei Tai can also take a look on this. Yeah, I see one that will be a uh, robot brought out an interest in network architecture of Catalin physics, which touch on question regarding TPS. To me, it seems like a form of consensus mechanism where they uh, dedicate the best NL to be the master and each of the NL closest to the master then contribute to the physical calculations. Yes, actually, um, to be honest, we have a large number of papers published recently regarding the uh, consensus models. Um, even though I'm working on, uh, I'm, 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 I'm working in university, right? I'm, I'm more like academic people. But uh, from this perspective, okay, from consensus model perspective, I, I believe um, uh, commercial adoption is the most important thing. Okay, I, I, I do see a lot of good papers. For example, Professor uh, David Sip from Stanford University, he published a paper and really implemented blockchain as well. And to be honest, after I read his paper, I feel like, wow, this is amazing. And I actually have a discussion with him uh, uh, last year, okay, for, for about two hours regarding the consensus model. It's interesting, okay, they're trying to separate uh, the voting process from, uh, from, the, uh, from the blocks so that they're able to significantly improve the TPS. But unfortunately, well, until today, I don't see a very successful model, uh, commercial models from their, uh, from their blockchain. So, I won't say, I will say that from an academic perspective, maybe it's good, yeah, maybe it's good, but uh, unfortunately we, we need the market to adopt that, that train because, well, um, you know, the consensus is not about, the con it's not only regarding the consensus of the algorithms, but also the consensus of the public. We need to make sure that uh, we have more, we have the majority of the society to accept uh, this uh, new consensus model. For example, like proof of work, we know proof of work is not good. We are consuming a lot of, uh, uh, electricity is, is a waste of uh, resource, but it seems that majority still believe POS is the best choice, right? So far, right? So probably, um, yeah. So that that would be my idea. I mean, we we, we need the market. We need market to uh, to accept uh, the new models. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. I think due to the time constraints, so we probably uh, we will end this session now. And the thanks again. Uh, Thanks for the, the great speech from Taiwei. So, Professor Tai, yeah. Um, yeah. And I will hand it over to, uh, I think, Alvin. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks, Tim, and thanks, uh, Professor uh, Wee for giving a really uh, great pre uh, presentation on the interactive uh, multimedia and the blockchain. And so, uh, so right now, um, so let me introduce, uh, briefly introduce the, the Dr. Anu uh, Basu. So Dr. Anu Basu has been uh, a professor uh, in the computing science department uh, at University of Alberta since uh, 1999, at least the multimedia research center. And his major interest of uh, uh, research areas are computer graphics, computer vision, uh, and, multi uh, and multimedia communications. So the current research applications include uh, multi-dimensional uh, image processing and uh, visualize, uh, visualization for medical consumer 
uh, and re uh, remote sensing applications, the multimedia in uh, education and games, and uh, and robust wireless three three dimensional multimedia transmission. Uh, and nowadays, we 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 all know uh, machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence has become a really a hot topic and everyone is talking about AI machine learning and using it or relying it on their own uh, research work or the industrial uh, projects. So uh, I'm glad to have uh, Dr. Uh, Anu Basu to give us a talk on computation and machine learning. And... Okay, I can uh, unmute okay. finally. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so my uh, talk actually um, may not be too related to um, uh, blockchain, but I'll um, have some slides in the end and we can discuss some possibilities, uh, especially uh, with uh, uh, Tim. Tim actually uh, took a course with me a long time back. So yeah. he's young. Huh? Yeah. And I remember he was a very good student. Uh, so, and then he worked on some other topics after that. Okay, so I will uh, share my screen now. Okay, um, yeah, to make the um, discussion more interactive, I don't mind if uh, people have their microphones open. Uh, so if that is possible, I don't know. Okay, so um, what I'll talk about more is uh, perceptually guided transmission and uh, maybe some potential applications in blockchain, uh, but I have to discuss more and understand how that can be done. I haven't seen too much work on applications of this area in blockchain. It seems like it's more on games and stuff. Um, so to review our past work, I'll give a quick overview of our work on biological and per perceptual factors. And uh, then there are some other things involved like estimating perceptual quality. We have done a lot of work on that, but I'll just give you a very brief uh, overview. And uh, then on compression for video conferencing, how we can in, in, in incorporate uh, perceptual factors in it. Uh, then motion capture data compression, packet loss during transmission, and uh, of mesh or of the mocap data, uh, dynamic point cloud transmission. And uh, finally, I'll discuss a little bit about how possibly a blockchain could be involved in multimedia transmission and in other applications, like um, maybe how do we share images, for example? How do we share video? Uh, and how do we share 3D objects, for example? Okay, so the first um, thing I would like to discuss is um, what are the differences between human and computer vision? So computer vision, we understand when we have cameras, they have the same resolution everywhere. So whether you go with a thousand by thousand or 480 by 512 and so on, we have the same resolution everywhere. And normally our cameras are static. So we have to actually physically move it somehow to uh, look at different parts of the scene. Now, uh, what will happen if a human vision was designed the same way? So uh, maybe I could get some input from people. So what do you think would be the problem? Anyone? It uh, seems like people don't have audio connection. Could they have audio? Yeah, actually, uh, for the, the, the security uh, consideration, we actually uh, set the permission that the participation cannot unmute by themselves. Oh, uh, could they be unmuted for now? Not too many people anyway. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's already, yeah, the permission has been enabled. Yeah, yeah because I like a more interactive talk. If I'm talking and everyone's sleeping, it's not good. <laughs> okay. Um, any suggestion? What will be the problem if uh, human vision was like computer vision? Let's see, uh, who would like to answer? Let's see, uh, Tim, 
How about you? <laughs> what do you think right. is the problem? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it's it's kind of a, it's kind of interesting question, right? So I actually uh, remember that we already like uh, uh, covered uh, like in the in the course, but in a more general sense, like uh, um, human um, and computer vision is basically uh, com computer vision is basically digital. So that is. Uh, 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 transform the uh, uh, basically the image into like um, like matrices and the digital data, right? And the human vision is, uh, in some sense, it's similar that the uh, the eyes uh, receive the uh, I mean the uh, I think some information and also uh, kind of like transform it into uh, I think electronic. Signals okay, in, uh, uh, to uh, the not, brand, so, right? uh, not so complicated. Um, I let me rephrase my question and to Tim and others. Um, what do you think will happen to our eyes? So, if you want to have high resolution everywhere and we don't want to move our eyes around, we don't have eye movement, so then what will happen? Okay, let me answer the question. So, uh, this will be the problem, right? So suppose you want like human quality vision with a computer vision system, then your eye will have to be very big. Do you see how big it is? So all our, um, we have to, uh, it may be as heavy as the rest of our body, okay? So uh, we don't have that, right? So instead what we do is we have very high resolution in a very limited area, only two degree field of view. So people don't believe me, so I ask them, uh, take a book and try to look at one letter, stare at one letter. You won't be able to even see the next letter clearly. That's how narrow our view uh, is. And our brain is amazing. So uh, we spend a huge percentage of our uh, brain processing images. Um, so the human vision is not even calibrated. So uh, what happens is when we are born, our vision is not calibrated. It's, it calibrates over time. So uh, let's see how a um, child sees images. Actually, this is not an image um, of a we looking at a child, but it's, uh, it, they should have put an adult picture here. It would be more representative. I got this image somewhere. So it would be better if they put the picture of a mother, for example. So at six months, you can see the picture on the left, a baby, uh, it, whatever it sees is kind of fuzzy. And so I think that's why for a small child, all the people look like, many people look like their father, many people look like their mother. So they're friendly with many people, right? But as they grow up, so at three years, for example, they can already clearly differentiate. And you get 20-20 vision only when you are an adult. So not even 13, 14 years old have 20-20 uh, vision. So uh, nowadays I see a lot of uh, optometrists that try to give um, glasses to young kids. I say probably that's not a great idea, right? Uh, because their child, their eyesight is still evolving. You don't want to interfere too much at that time. And so to um, understand this issue, if you uh, cover a kitten size, somebody did experiments with kittens, it's not uh, something I recommend, uh, but they cover a kitten's eye for a week or two after birth and the kitten becomes blind, right? Because it does not develop its uh, calibration at all. Um, so uh, what we have done over many years now is uh, try to understand how um, we can borrow from biology actually, and we can how we can solve problems in vision much better. So actually the whole AI field, people may not be aware, it actually started with computer vision. It did not, it did not start with machine learning, deep learning, or any of these things. It started with computer vision. Uh, so somebody in at MIT, uh, thought that the vision problem must be very easy to solve. So what he did was he got a camera, he put the camera to look outside and he got an undergraduate student and say, okay, this is looking for summer work. 
So he thought this must be a very easy problem. Uh, look at the scene outside and segment it. So, so that I know what's the person, what's the background, uh, something like that. He thought it's very simple because I can do it so easily, right? All of you can segment very, very easily. So it must be easy for a computer. So the segmentation problem is still unsolved. And there are many, many thousands of papers on this topic. So not one or two, maybe a million papers by now, but still unsolved. The problem is people try to pre um, define ground truth. So they, by hand, they draw boundaries on object and then they train it so it works well for that data set. You try it on another data set, doesn't work. And so the segmentation, you can think of a 2D problem. The computer vision is a 3D problem. It's a lot more difficult. So how to solve the in computer vision problem? So people thought the easy, easiest way to solve it is if we can correspond, right? So you take one point in one image and you take another point, you have to get the same point in the second image. Then you correspond and you can actually reconstruct 3D perfectly after that, if you could do that, right? And so actually, if anybody can solve the correspondence problem, then all of the problem in vision and image processing would be pretty much solved, okay? And so this problem has still not been solved. And uh, one reason why it is not solved, um, you have to understand the problem of computational complexity. This problem is NP hard. Even if I give you a collection of points on one image and a collection of points on the other image, it has been proved, uh, proved by actually my friend, uh, John Chochos in uh, Toronto. And now he's in New York University. He uh, kind of showed that this problem is NP hard, long time back, uh, but still people try to solve the correspondence problem. So uh, what we try to do instead is what can we do to bypass the correspondence problem? Uh, that is if you're given a collection of points in one image, a collection of points in another image, can we still solve some problems? So what I found long time back is if you have multiple eyes or multiple cameras, right? Uh, then you could solve the problem of motion estimation, just translation estimation, like something is moving and I would like to have the 3D translation, delta X, delta Y, delta Z, right? So this problem you cannot solve without correspondence if you're given one camera. And with stereo, you need stereo correspondence, but if you have four cameras, you can solve this one. Um, and uh, that's why probably you'll see that flies have compound eyes and flies are very, very good at motion estimation. You try to, uh, if a fly is not tired, you try to hit the fly and see how much success you have. It's very difficult to hit a fly. Um, uh, next, uh, what we had looked at is the problem of correspondence, uh, calibration rather. So our eyes can move left, right, up and down. So we call it pan and tilt, and it can also have a torsional movement. It can move around um, the, X, the Z axis, the axis going right out of my eye. So if I have a camera that can have this kind of movement, then it's very easy to uh, get the um, calibration parameters like the FX, FY on the center of the lens. And you don't need any correspondence. You don't need to show it any kind of patterns, right? And um, so that's why uh, possibly humans don't need to look at a pattern to calibrate its size, right? We go get up in the morning, sometimes things are fuzzy. And uh, then we uh, roll our eyes around, we wash our eyes and stuff and gradually things become very clear. And uh, maybe this is the way uh, that uh, we start to calibrate where, after we are born. And that's why it takes time and to calibrate all the things in our brain uh, takes time. Um, so uh, next uh, we looked at uh, representations um, when we look at a scene. So obviously we don't see everything very clearly, right? So only things we are interested in as we look at things of interest, they, uh, they, we see them clearly. And that's why we think everything is clear because whatever we are interested in, our eyes move and look at our point of interest and whatever we are, the power point of interest is, that is clear. So we uh, oftentimes don't care about other things. 
So can this idea be also used um, for uh, compression? So uh, this is some work we had done long time back and we had done a lot of follow up work. And actually uh, these things have become part of standards and many people have followed us uh, some without referencing for a while, then I had to tell them that we had published this 10 years ago. And uh, still people follow this idea. Uh, so as an example, uh, suppose you uh, do this JPEG compression. I have this um, image on the bottom left and you see this famous uh, linear picture. Um, so uh, this picture, uh, I give you the same bit rate. So this is compressed with JPEG, the picture in the middle. Uh, the one in the left is the original image and the one on the right, uh, all I have done is I've taken the original image, then I've created a small version of the image and then I've applied JPEG so that the overall compression is the same. So the bit rate is the same. Uh, but you can see you can outperform JPEG by a mile uh, just by using attention. Um, so we have also, uh, we also used it for like uh, video uh, compression over 28.8 kilobits, long time back. And uh, with telecommunication research labs and uh, one company in actually uh, Arizona called Research Technologies Corporation, they uh, commercialized this. They gave me some royalty. I still have it in an account, uh, $20,000 or something after the university took uh, uh, part of the share. So, and then uh, others commercialize some of these things. Um, now, uh, looking into 3D now, not 2D, but in 3D, uh, we can consider how to estimate perceptual quality in 3D. Uh, now to do that, uh, what we had done um, quite a few years ago is uh, we looked at a 3D model. The left one here is the best quality and the right one here is maybe the worst we can accept. So if we say the left one has a rating of five and the right one is a rating of one, uh, then we show referential uh, stimuli. What we do is we have arbitrary combination of mesh and, um, and the texture, and we create the models in the middle, and then we ask a user to rate it. So between one and five. And uh, based on the rating, what we can do is we can see how our human perception changes as we provide more detail in terms of the model. Uh, so what we found is if you increase the geometry beyond a certain level, it does not have much of a perceptual impact. So there is no point like refining a 3D model more and more and more if you put uh, color and texture on it. Uh, however, if you put um, improve the quality of a texture, for example, if you have a screen and you increase the resolution more and more, the human perception, it likes the quality more and more. So the quality keeps increasing. So um, actually you will uh, observe this also in all the multimedia screens that we see. The television screen, they keep on increasing the resolution more and more, right? And they, uh, we had uh, gone back and forth between 3D TV and so on. And people don't accept the 3D as much because they cannot accept the higher quality. Uh, uh, that you may or may not get by providing three-dimensional structure. So uh, what we did after that is we also came up with a quality estimate given a bandwidth restriction. We can optimize between geometry and texture to optimize the quality. Um, now, uh, recently, over the last 10 years or so, uh, we had done some work on 3D modeling and how to use 3D modeling for uh, robust ultra low bit rate uh, transmission. So some uh, work in that area we had done is we try to model the scene and we try to model our people in, uh, with 3D. And uh, then we try to remove background, for example, if our camera is static or moving, uh, one of our students working a lot on this topic and quite a few now. So uh, there is some AI in, on this topic on background removal that we have used. So uh, one approach uh, that people have been following is using deep learning, but deep learning, you have to add more and more layers and you have to train it more and more. So an alternative that we found is we can use distribution learning. So what the distribution learning does instead 
is we just look at one pixel in, a, in an image and we look at the distribution of this pixel over time. Now, uh, one thing that can happen with any learning strategy is we may overfit uh, to the data. So to avoid that, what we do is we randomly permute uh, the temporal sequence. So we keep the distribution like a histogram, uh, but there is no knowledge from uh, one, one is not related to two, because one could be the 10th observation and two could be the 50th observation and so on. So we permuted uh, observations over time. And after that, um, we do a Bayesian refinement uh, to remove the noise. You can see these dots uh, are gone here. And also if you have say vibrations of the leaves and stuff, so small um, noise you can remove with the Bayesian refinement model. And uh, recently, uh, Cheng Xiu uh, Zhao is working on this topic. Uh, we have actually, the middle uh, thing in uh, brown here, it's, it's not one layer, but it was like about 10 layers that we used. And recently we uh, looked into the distribution of addition, subtraction, and so on, different kind of operations on pixels. And we are able to reduce the number of layers in between to only four. And still we beat uh, deep learning with like 50, 60 layers right now by a big margin. Uh, because we are learning about the distribution and we are not overfitting. Uh, we also improved this uh, using several techniques. Um, so because we uh, don't have too much time and I want to go over, uh, have some discussion on the blockchain. So I will uh, now show some um, other work that we had done. So one work is on enhancing video conferencing. So uh, this we had done a long time back. Now we can do it even better, hopefully, uh, but uh, not using only learning. Some of our students want to do everything with learning. I say that is not possible. Uh, so you still need to know some graphics. And if you're not good at graphics, then you cannot do these things, right? You cannot just uh, create models of human face over time and try to do morphing. That's not a very efficient way. So uh, what we have done in the past is we fitted a model, a 3D model to a human face. And uh, then uh, we customized it based on the face. So you can see the customization and uh, I can move this model to make realistic expressions. Now, what, uh, how do, we, uh, do I do the uh, animation? What I can do is I can simply track some points on a face. You can see these are the only points I need to track. And these points can be used to customize. Uh, so it reduces the computational complexity, the transmission cost significantly. So it makes it like in the kilobit range from uh, gigabit uh, range per second. Uh, now we can do the same thing, but for a whole human model. And we, here also we can use uh, perceptual factors. Like if I move my fingers, then uh, a small error in the finger movement, you are not going to notice. Uh, but if I have uh, if I have error in movement, um, oops, sorry. Uh, if I have error in movement of my uh, the of my, the bone in the leg, for example, uh, then you are going to notice it much more easily. So it's basically the length of a bone uh, that makes a big difference in the in how we perceive, and also. If we are in contact with the surface, for example, the legs are in contact with the ground, uh, then you are going to notice it more easily. So uh, this one, uh, the video here shows some example of um, what we can do uh, with 3D modeling and uh, with compression of the motion capture data. So on the left, is a 3D modeled uh, dance sequence. So this is already very much compressed compared to a video, right? Uh, but on the right, you can see I have compressed it like 85 to one. So we are going down to really in the kilobits range. And still you can see very nice uh, images here. 
And um, so there are some other uh, things to consider. So one is uh, the problem with packet loss during uh, transmission. So for 3D, we can have packet loss from uh, different sources. We can have packet loss during the mesh, transmission of the mesh. And uh, we can have packet loss during transmission of the motion sequences. So how different vertices on the mesh uh, move. So here is an example. Um, so we created a model and we made 16 packets. So I lost uh, one out of 16. That's like only 16, 6% loss. So you can see, I can see this, uh, the holes in the mesh, right? So this problem can be resolved somewhat if we uh, can interpolate. But you can see that uh, the right hoof, I cannot interpolate because the one packet, it contained information in that part and it got lost. So how to address uh, that problem? So what we did instead is um, we made the mesh into one long strip. It, will, it is like you take a orange and you peel the orange. So you get one very long strip, right? And then you don't make packets by looking at adjacent vertices in this long strip, but you could take the first vertex, of the first vertex, and then you could take the 10th one, then you could take the 21st one, 20th one, and so on, right? So I kind of jump as I create uh, the packets. So in that case, when I lose a packet, I don't lose all the information in one area, but my dis uh, loss is kind of distributed. And um, uh, doing this, what I can do is, you can see on the left, I've lost more than 50% of the packets, right? But still I can interpolate and I can create a cow that looks like the one on the right, right? Um, now uh, we can consider packet loss during uh, motion capture. So when we have motion capture, uh, we are going to lose information um, about the motion, uh, about how things move between um, in a time sequence. So for that, um, uh, we wanted to look at uh, error resiliency during uh, motion capture transmission. So you can see the on the top is the original sequence. Um, then we have a very simple, inter simple um, strategy, a serialized transmission, then an interleaved transmission, uh, then interleaved with uh, LD um, uh, PC, low density uh, priority check coding. So a special kind of coding technique. Uh, so this um, sequence is, you can see the last one, we got, um, even with loss, we could still retain quality that's, uh, that keeps us very close to the original one. So here is a video sequence of that. So I'll show a little bit of that. So uh, this is like a breakdown clip. So you can see the simple strategy um, uh, doesn't quite work as well. So this is interleaved strategy and with the LDPC uh, coding added on top of that, it's uh, very close to the original one. I don't exactly remember how much uh, loss there was on this one, uh, but it did pretty well even for a significant amount of loss. Uh, then we also considered um, dynamic point clouds. So how to visualize uh, dynamic point clouds. So um, in dynamic point clouds, we uh, basically don't have any connectivity. So we just have a sequence of points. So one 3D point set, then the next one, then the next one, and so on. And uh, so how can we um, interactively visualize dynamic point clouds and also compress those? So uh, here are two examples. So uh, these are basically run on an ordinary laptop. And uh, these are just points, oops, sorry. Uh, these are just points so on the left 
it's like a walking sequence on the right. It's like a salsa dance sequence. And um, you can visualize it um, only with points. And uh, the nice thing with point clouds is even if we lose uh, information in terms of uh, points, uh, we can still uh, display things. And we can also interact and visualize things from any, any direction. So whether you want to look at things from the top, bottom, side, and so on, uh, we can visualize from uh, any direction. Um, now, I would like to have some discussion on uh, potential uh, strategies for incorporating blockchain in multimedia transmission and some potential uh, directions and challenges. Um, now, uh, what, uh, these are just my thoughts and uh, we'll have uh, more discussion on, on this. Uh, so first of all, uh, we need to think about uh, dividing multimedia objects into blocks and uh, possibly each uh, block is, uh, will have a different owner. And we can think of objects uh, that can be decoded only when all the owners contribute and also we follow the chain. Though I don't quite understand uh, whether the chain is needed or useful in terms of um, uh, multimedia transmission. That's something we can discuss later. So uh, how is um, uh, information uh, distributed and uh, combined? When, uh, uh, how can we do that? So actually there are some uh, encryption strategies in which we divide images into shape. Unless all people come together, you cannot reconstruct the original image. And uh, this is a little bit different from the blockchain art uh, that Tim discussed yesterday. So I, have, I actually downloaded one picture, Ars Electronical. I had visited them in Austria a long time back. And it seems uh, they have also gotten into this blockchain art and they are kind of quite successful on this, I, I saw. So the idea behind um, this creating the secret um, keys for uh, images is the following. This is a very simple um, uh, discussion. Actually, it's, not, it's more com much more complicated than this. So what we can do is you can think of binary pixels, just zero and one. So on the top, I have a white pixel, zero. And on the bottom, I have this black here, right? So what can be done is um, the white pixel, I can create two shares, S1 and S2. So you can see S1 and S2, the first row, the left part is black. On the second one, the right part is black. The left part is white. So if you combine S1 and S2, uh, actually this should be S3, there's a typo here. I'll get this one. So half black, half white. So the bottom one also half black, half white. Now, uh, why do I make uh, two types here? So I have, uh, you can toss a coin and make two types. So either you to go, decide to go with the top one or you decide to go with the bottom one. Uh, the reason I do that is I don't want it, uh, I want it to be confused with also the transmission of a black pixel. So you have only white and black, zero and one. So uh, suppose I don't do this, then what will happen is um, if I get one, uh, a one sample from that, I can infer it is black or white, right? Now you will see here that in the bottom, even for the black, the tokens are actually similar to the tokens at the top. So if one person just looks at his, own, at, uh, his or her own token, uh, they cannot make out whether the pixel is black or white, right? Uh, but you can see here, if I put the two together at the bottom, so if you put these two parts together at the bottom, you get a black, or you put th these two together at the bottom, you'll also get a black. And uh, this concept can be generalized uh, so that uh, we can have representation uh, for grayscale. So we can, it, this is done by gray, half toning, gray shares. Uh, and I think it can also be done by bit planes also, but uh, people you decide to use something called gray shares instead. 
And um, uh, for colors, you can think of colors as a combination of three grayscales. So this becomes uh, bigger and more complicated. And also to main aspect ratio, uh, because if I create pixels in this way, you can see that uh, the pictures will get kind of stretched out uh, horizontally. So to maintain aspect ratio, people expand uh, this concept even further. Uh, now the secret uh, key sharing, how does it look for a binary image? Suppose I have this Canadian flag at the top, uh, then I create these two shares in the middle and uh, by itself, you cannot see anything from these two shares, but when you combine, you can see the something that's close to the original one. Um, so uh, some future considerations and uh, challenges that um, uh, we can think of is uh, how to preserve the original quality after uh, decryption. So I'm not sure. And um, um, also, uh, do we need to keep the entire image secret or how much secrecy to put in different parts of the image? So something we need to think about uh, because otherwise our cost is going to be higher. And as some people mentioned that one of the problem with blockchain is it will inherently slow down uh, the process, right? Uh, now, the third thing I'm thinking of, and it's something that maybe we should consider, is uh, how much um, people like uh, digital, how much they will continue to like digital things and continue to like Zoom, for, for example. So many of us are very, very tired of Zoom. So we may think this will grow, but there is a good possibility it may not. People may get tired, right, of the being on, on the screen all the time. So we may need, need uh, think of something else. And in that case, we may need to think of printed secrets. So I may have a printed version of an image and unless I can get together with a certain number of people, I won't be able to find out what is the image about. Uh, now, another thing we can think about is how to extend this concept to video and to 3D. So what is uh, the generalization of this concept? So uh, how can we think about people getting together to put together a 3D uh, structure, right? So each person may have a piece of it, but from this piece, they won't be able to reconstruct anything. They won't be able to, to uh, make head or tail out of it. But when it's put together, uh, then we can have something. Um, now, the other thing that I wasn't very clear about is um, what kind of uh, links, uh, uh, what would be the advantage or disadvantage to have um, a chain or the sequence, like one and then two and then three. So if you're distributing amongst 50 people, for example, then in blockchain, uh, my understanding is that you kind of need to follow a chain, right? If you break the chain, then also it doesn't work. Not only uh, do the parts need to come together, but you need to maintain a certain chain also. So uh, what is the corresponding concept for um, uh, this multimedia objects that uh, I discussed here? And um, uh, so I'll just stop here and I, I'll just uh, encourage some discussion now in the remaining time. And uh, actually we have published many papers in this area over the years and uh, with more publications recently. And, uh, but um, uh, I'd like to now have some open discussion on this topic. Okay. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Anubasu. And uh, because everyone right now has the permission to unmute, so I think, yes, we encourage everyone to open for discussion. Uh, hi, hi, no. Hello. So I think, that, yeah, hi. Hello, Sean, I think this kind of, yeah. yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, I heard the last uh, several pages. I think this is kind of interesting because in blockchain area, we have something called crypto arts. And in the crypto arts, we have the, the, the state channel inside the smart contract that can decide which pixel or which image we want to use the state. So. Uh, what I'm interesting about is about uh, the grayscale. So actually maybe few, in the future, we can build up some depths or crypto arts 
that is written in smart contract and each pixel or each state channel will represent the, the one part of the image and the whole, the whole smart contract together, they can be governance by different crypto artists. And if they collaborate together in the end, they can build up a, a pixel or a crypto arts. And that will be kind of the a social, social creation or something. I'm not sure, yeah. but this, this, this is the first time I've heard about the concept. I think this is quite interesting, yeah. Yeah, actually, um, I was thinking uh, beyond crypto art. So that's something that uh, mm -hmm. um, Tim mentioned yesterday, right? And there's some work on that. But I'm thinking beyond that, I'm thinking of uh, existing artwork. Mm -hmm. And so how can we uh, put this in the blockchain? Mm -hmm. So uh, we can think of like uh, Mona Lisa, but you don't go to gallery, right? You don't have to go to uh, Paris to see that. But uh, probably uh, what is a similar concept in, in terms of maybe uh, 10 people in Edmonton have are the first ones to have access to this original art. So I don't mm. know if it even makes any sense. So I, that's why I want to have some discussion. Um, and uh, so I think it's, uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's very open and how to create this also, it's, it's very challenging. And also um, uh, what I was thinking is uh, people may get tired of online. So uh, mm. what is, uh, what should we do that? So in terms of, um, the encryption, uh, one area that people have considered is called battlefield ready, right? So suppose in, you are at a war, right? So some of us are friends and some of us are enemies. Now the friends can put together a secret together. So you may have one copy of the secret and I have the other copy of the secret, right? So we put both of them together, then I can get the Canadian flag, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, so I can have your version printed and I can have my version printed and we carry it separately. Then when we get together, we can say, OK, now today we have to attack Canadian, for example. Well, I'm, I don't want to, but I'm just uh, giving an example yeah, so yeah, with think, the flag. Right. Yeah. So this one is kind of interesting because usually in the cryptography, we, we each of us have our secret uh, key and public key. Right. When right. we make the secret key and public key uh, together, we can sign for some message and we can do some trans transfer or something. This is the kind of the idea about two uh, NFT, two non-fungible tokens. Maybe they can transmutation together or maybe they can pair together and they can create a new graph such as the Canadian flag. And yeah. each of us, we can combine them together or alchemy them together. This is kind of an interesting idea. And um, actually, uh, we can think about how to generalize. It's not very clear, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how yes. to generalize from two to multiple? What will be, so if you're considering art or images, it may have a negative effect on the quality of the image. So how to preserve the original quality also mm -hmm. and uh, where it is meaningful, why it is not. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's quite, quite uh, interesting actually. And uh, to extend to video and 3D, very, very open problems. Mm, right. I see, I see. And um, so what is the concept of the chain here? So for example, I am number one, uh, you are number two and say team is number three. So does the order matters or how to incorporate an ordering? Because right now we don't have that concept. Uh, it's, uh, it's just that we can think of a collection of people coming together. If they put their individual slides together, then they can get the final picture. Right. Mm. But how to even incorporate a chain in this? I, I'm not sure. Uh, I think I have like my two cents on the chain thing. So even though like uh, today seeing like blockchain, uh, I mean, in the blockchain world, we already like uh, thinking about like, is a chain necessary or is a chain kind of like, a, is there any other form of kind of this data structure have like better maybe efficiency or like better, kind of uh, data quality, right? Um, so the original idea of the chain is that because we have a distributed, so the original design was to solve a financial problem. So we have a distributed ledger. So in the ledger, so all these kind of like uh, business in this line and entries, they need to come in order, 
right? So that's why we need to have a chain so that we, pres we kind of like preserve the order of all these transactions. That's the origin idea. But in the real world, um, I mean, applications, uh, there are some data, they are not like necessarily kind of correlated. Maybe in one blockchain, even though like in current blockchain world, right? So we store a lot of data there. So some of these data are, there's no, there's no correlations between them, right? So um, there, there are already kind of, um, it's, it's kind of like a distributed, right? So it, because in, in some like a distributed data system uh, for the, uh, to improve the kind of like scalability or like efficiency, then we don't, we don't kind of like, uh, we don't, we don't kind of like a, uh, 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 preserve the order or like the correlation between them. We put them like a parallel. Right, we put the put the data into a system parallel. So I think currently there are similar kind of innovations in blockchain that uh, one innovation is similar to the uh, distributed database, which is called sharding. Right. So we put we kind of like split the chunk of data into different shards, and then in different shards uh, they preserve some kind of correlations or like sequence. But between the shards, there's no sequence because there's no there's no kind of correlations between the data uh, between the data in two shards. So uh, this kind of uh, uh, kind of optimization we can put problem we can uh, like uh, probably probably we can uh, put something like a clustering algorithm on top of it to kind of uh, put these data with correlation together. For example, uh, if we want to put something into a picture. Um, if the, these two, these two colors are in the same same kind of pos position or same pixel, these colors need to be layered one by one, so they have correlation. But uh, maybe in some other pixel, these um, owned by in some other position position, so they are not correlated. So we can we don't care about the order, right? So I think there might uh, there is there is like potential or spaces we can kind of optimize the data structure of a chain. Instead of a chain, we have like uh, multiple parallel chains or multiple like shards, shards that to improve the uh, kind of performance. Yeah. Yeah, another uh, issue that I was thinking about is uh, uh, what if we lose some members, right? So, um, so probably we need to think of redundancy also. Yeah. Right? Uh, because otherwise, um, yeah, this blockchain actually is, um, you cannot assume that all the members will be there. Otherwise, you can, you can do that if they're all uh, bots. But uh, that also depends on the computer that's running the bot. And uh, if the um, that computer has problem, then uh, people can lose their uh, Bitcoin, right? And so what is the concept of redundancy? How much redundancy we, we should have, how to distribute the redundancy. So we we cannot assume that nothing will ever happen. I think cur in current, uh, just specifically to this question, I think <coughs> current blockchain's design is kind of 100% redundancy, right? It's because mm -hmm. we keep the same same ledger in every computer. Mm -hmm. So there, unless the whole network is done, then uh, the data is, at least we have some copies. Uh, but uh, just ac according to my previous kind of suggestion, if we consider sharding, we definitely need to have some certain level of redundancy, maybe like a certain, maybe 20%, 30%, or 50% redundancy, but to make sure uh, there's 